Well, I want to welcome you all again to today's webinar, Get More Opens with Great Subject Lines. Thank you so much for joining us today. One of the hardest truths about email marketing is that you only have about three seconds to convince someone to open your email. That's because people are making quick decisions as they process their overflowing inboxes each and every day. You wanna really stop your subscribers in their tracks and entice them to take the next step, which is to open up your email. So beyond the sender information, who the email is coming from, the brunt of that responsibility is going to fall on your subject line. So how do you regularly come up with a great subject line to get more opens for each of your emails? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. Let's take a look at, at our agenda and see how we're gonna structure today's session. We're gonna start out by talking about some more basic general tips for writing great subject lines and a few things to keep in mind there. Then we're gonna talk about some ideas that will help you help to spark your creativity. And then we're gonna talk about some data-driven subject lines that tend to work for a lot of businesses and organizations out there. Now, before we get into all of the details, allow me to introduce myself as well as my guest for today. My name is Stephanie French and I'm the Senior Content Manager for webinars here at Constant Contact. I've been at Constant Contact for over 11 years now, so I'm well-versed in email and online marketing. And I'm very happy to introduce our guest speaker for the day, Jaina Mystery. She is the Senior Manager of Email Marketing at Litmus. Do you wanna hop on and just say a quick hello, Jaina? Sure thing. Hi everyone, I'm really, really excited to be here today. I love talking about all things email and especially subject lines and helping other email marketers get the most out of their email marketing. So uh, yeah, excited to share some tips and tricks. Awesome, and I love your experience and everything we've done to prep for this, so I know you've got some great things to share. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's talk about tips for writing great subject lines. I First, I wanna just break it down a little bit in the inbox. If you're not familiar with everything you do see or someone would see when they see your email in the inbox. First up is going to be your from name. We know that 45% of subscribers will open an email simply based on who it's from because they trust that person or that business. This information actually happens to be the most important here. And then we've got our subject line. The subject line is what will give all of your subscribers a reason to open this email. Why should they open this email now? And we know that 33% of subscribers will open an email strictly based on the subject line. And then we've got the pre-header text, which is actually down below that. The pre-header text is actually an extension of that subject line and provides a little bit more context as to what your email is about. So the from name is always going to supersede the subject line. So first and foremost, you want to make sure that that from name is easily recognizable by your audience and that they trust who the email is coming from. So as you can see, the subject line and pre-header text are both very important pieces to getting your email opened. And ultimately, we want to suggest that those two pieces really be working together. So Jaina, what's your advice here? How do we make the subject line and the pre-header text work the best together? Great question. And, and I know it seems like the subject line and pre-header text are two distinct items, but because they're seen kind of next to each other or on top of each other in, uh, in an email, in an inbox, I'd suggest avoid repeating any information so if you've written a specific word or a phrase in your subject line avoid repeating yourself in the preview text because it can be repetitive for your subscribers who are taking who are, who are receiving your emails and seeing in, in the inbox. so that would be my my main tip to help them work together how do you how do you form them in in a way that's not repetitive but supporting each other i love that point about not being repetitive because sometimes i see very similar or almost the same words and thing written within the subject line and you can really entice someone to open once you're giving them a, just a little bit more idea of what they will get when they open your email so in the inbox there is that short snippet of the subject line and pre-header text that people will see now it can look a little bit longer if someone's on a desktop computer which is of course a wider screen and it's going to look even smaller if someone's viewing that on their mobile device. So you've got that really skinny screen. So especially when you're, we're thinking about mobile, we've got a few recommendations for you. 
For your subject line, we want to suge suggest four to seven words. And then for the pre-header text, we suggest five to eight words. Now, this is just some general advice, like I said, when thinking about your subject lines and how they might look on a mobile. Now, I also know that I've seen some really great performing subject lines from our customers in my own inbox. Those are longer, and I believe you've seen some longer ones that tend to perform well too, Jaina. So what's your advice here in regards to thinking about a length that would work for, for you and your own audience? I would say it's one of those things, one of the many things that we do as marketers is to test all the things. But um, if you get some insights on your own audience, so where are uh, your audience opening your emails? Is it on a mobile device? Is it on a desktop device? Is it on a webmail client? Because as Stephanie said, each of those different devices show different amounts of text and copy from the subject line and the pre-header text. So think about that. See if, you, see if you can dig into that data, because what you want to avoid is say, yes, you you do lean into those longer subject lines or pre-header text. You want to avoid those getting truncated at those embarrassing points where your subject line has a completely different meaning to what you intended it to be. So I think that's kind of my advice when it comes to length. Try and figure out where your audience is opening your emails and test and see whether your audience engages better with longer subject lines or shorter subject lines. Awesome. And tech, uh, testing is actually going to be a theme that kind of goes through everything we're talking about today. So definitely keep that in the back of your mind. And we're going to talk more about that as we progress through, through this session. Something that I see every once in a while is people will use things like March update or February update or March newsletter and February newsletter. I really want to suggest to you that the biggest thing to think about when writing an email subject line is to think about the value of what's in it for your subscribers. Why should they they open this email? And I don't really know or think that those can really provide value to those subscribers. Jaina, I don't know, is there anything else you wanna maybe add to that? Yeah, I agree. I think those kind of subject lines are so common, so prevalent that they're not gonna help your email stand out in the inbox. And also thinking about the inbox, a lot of folks tend to um, search through their inbox. So imagine if you are trying to find a specific newsletter or a specific email that you've just seen, but you can't find again. So you try and type it into the search. Um, having keywords and having some interesting words in your subject line can help folks who are using their inbox to search for specific emails and increase the searchability of your emails in the inbox. So they may have opened it one time and they want to go back to it, but they can't find it. And the search isn't bringing it up because you're using a very generic subject line. So that's another reason why um, having subject lines that are a bit more unique to each email versus something that's very generic and could be used across multiple different senders. That's a great point. And that is actually something that I do all the time is I am very organized person. So I have all these folders. If you're sending me really good content that I want to go back and reference my, for my job or my personal life, I'm going to organize it. And then eventually I'm going to want to find that again. So I'm going to do a search in my inbox. So I really love that example. So the next thing I want to suggest is that you all be careful with what you're putting in your subject line because you don't want to be uh, deceptive or misleading in any way. I feel like I'm starting to see, unfortunately, a resurgence of the RE and even the fake FWD in my own inbox. So Jaina, what are your thoughts here and how do we be more careful with what we're putting in our subject lines? Yeah, both of these came about, or I feel like they, they started to come more prevalent because uh, senders are trying to force their emails to be delivered to the inbox, the primary inbox versus say a promotions folder or be automatically sorted by, uh, by the inbox provider. So having FWD and RE makes the email look more like it's from a specific person, but you're, you're, tricking, um, you're tricking the algorithms behind the actual inbox there. You're not, and you're forcing the email to be delivered into a place that the end user might not be expecting it at, which can feel very spammy and it's, it's, it's just not a very nice way to act as a sender. And it actually can be um, an issue with anti-spam laws as well. So I would suggest avoid using FWD, RE, anything that could make your subject line feel misleading. Definitely, and I, I also don't like when something sounds very urgent, but you open it up and you read it and you're like, that oh, wasn't very urgent. Mm -hmm. So we want to be careful of things like that. And then also make sure your, your subject lines are accurate, especially for transactional subject lines and, and things like that. And don't try to trick people and say something's an order, order or a payment confirmation when it is not. 
definitely some laws that you could be getting in trouble with there. And you're going to not really have that great relationship with your subscribers if you do stuff like that. Often I see people try to get so creative and stand out in the inbox. What I do want to say is that, just a reminder, not everything in every email you send has to have the most creative subject line out there. In fact, I've actually seen some really simple and straightforward subject lines perform very well. Do you have any insight that maybe you would want to share on that as well? Yeah, we uh, we have pretty very straightforward subject lines. In fact, for our weekly newsletter called Litmus Weekly, um, in the entire subject line, we summarize the key pieces of content that are featured in the newsletter and it always works really well. We don't try and add any fluff to it. We are very simple and straightforward and it, it, our audience for that specific program are very attuned to it. So they really know what they're getting in for and they know exactly what they'll be getting once they open it. So I'm all for being more straightforward um, for certain campaigns if that's going to work because, but then there's also always going to be opportunities for you to be more creative with other email campaigns. So there's always, it's nice to have a bit of a balance between the two of them. I completely agree. And I see a question in the, the question window from Jason. He says, what about the RE on the resend offer by Constant Contact? So it's an automatic resend that they can set up in their account. Is using RE in that subject line for the resend a good tactic to use on those non-opened emails? I would say no. Um, I think it's a better idea to in fact change the entire subject line altogether I mean, if, if if it's a resend and you're trying to get people to engage again because they didn't necessarily open on the first time around i think you're better off changing the entire subject line and even the pre-header text to change the positioning of it because there's something the first time around that didn't get their attention so you need to take a bit more of a different tactic for that second time around i completely agree that's a, a great point there so the next thing to think about is using power words that will catch someone's attention. So we're gonna show a few examples on the screen, but of course you wanna make sure you're using power words, but you don't want such a power word that gets back into what we were just talking about where it's a little bit deceptive. You don't wanna over promise. So words like inspire, maybe you wanna inspire someone's creativity, inspire them to take action. They wanna learn something. You wanna guide them all along the way. You want them to enjoy something, enjoy life, enjoy this guide or this educational piece of content you're sending to them. And then don't forget, it's always a good idea to, especially when you're focusing on selling your product or your service or whatever it is, focus on pain points for your subscribers. Maybe that's ready, maybe they're ready to make a change. Maybe they wanna save, save time, save money. Maybe they wanna stop doing something altogether that goes back to saving time. Improve or even faster, I think are really great power words to use in a subject line. So what kind of guidance do you have for figuring out what the best words to use might be in your subject line, Jaina? I'm going to start being repetitive here, but testing on your own audience and figuring out what sort of power words really work for your audience is what I would always advise everyone to do from right, right from the get go. Um, we often use words like easier, like easier email building is one of the key, like I swear it's an email subject line I think we may have actually used this week and faster email workflow. So we definitely lean into focusing on those pain points because that's exactly what we want to help our customers um, solve. Um, we tend to avoid using slightly negative words like stop and avoid, but when we do use them, we will combine them with the more positive words because I think sometimes you can you can make people feel a little bit too negative by using those negative pain point words. So if you balance it with something that's a little bit more positive, you can still encourage someone to do something by like getting them to think of like that fear of missing out or that FOMO, but then bring about the positive reasons like why they shouldn't be missing out. Awesome. I, I love that whole idea of balancing, especially if you're, it might sound a little bit negative in your subject line with the power word, and then you can balance it out in that pre-header text. Again, how they should really be playing together. So that is great. So let's talk about some ideas and examples uh, for how you might use those power words. This first one is from an example marketing services company. The subject line is learn how to improve your marketing ROI where learn is the power word and it's right at the beginning, which I think is a good tip. If you're gonna use a power word, use it more towards the beginning of the subject line. 
The second one is down, uh, it down is actually from an animal rescue. Get ready to inspire change in the world. That one actually uses two of those power words, ready and inspire. And then this last one is enjoy our favorite designs at 10% off, where enjoy is that power word at the beginning and I think really catching people's attention that way. All right, so let's go ahead and move on and talk about some ideas that will help you get more to get more creative in your subject lines. So what ideas do you have for helping our audience to get creative in their in their subject lines? I know you've got a few examples you're using with your team, Jaina. Yes, I like to get the team to just brainstorm. So put a do a brain dump of about five to ten different subject lines in the copy document that you're working from because Often what I struggle with is I will try and find that perfect subject line and write it the first time straight away and that's never going to work. So what happens when you write more than one between like five and ten, you'll start seeing a pattern of um, subject lines that read really, really well. And it's definitely worth doing combinations of subject lines and pre-headed text because as we talked about it, they both work really, really well together um, and they have to work well together. So do a kind of a brain dump of the two and what I like to do is I'll often write the content or copy of the email first and really understand the goal of the email. What am I trying to get our customers or subscribers to do with the content and copy of the email? And then I'll go back to the subject line so I can use the subject line as kind of that first entry point to driving folks to that call to action um, and, and get people to hopefully open and then click and take action on the email. But it's it's always subject lines are challenging because there's so much pressure that goes in a subject line it has to it has to work really yes I know I always feel the pressure from people in these types of webinars when we're talking about subject lines and they want to make sure they're getting it right now I actually know some people who actually save copies of subject lines or even headlines that stand out to them and they put them in what's called a swipe file some of them will save this type of information in a spreadsheet or a Word document or something like that. And when you're feeling stuck and like you can't figure out what kind of subject line or what direction you wanna go, they'll go and they'll look in this document for inspiration. And I actually love the idea of, you know, maybe you take your swipe file uh, and you pick one out of there and maybe uh, brainstorm five to 10 ideas like Jaina was saying to come up with the best subject line that's gonna work for your particular email. And I wanted to show you an example of what that might look like. Obviously, I'm not advocating for you to take a subject line that someone else has written and copy it word for word. Please don't do that. But what I want you to do is look for things in that subject line that you've saved and see what really stood out to you in the first place. What, what, why did you like uh, save that situation? excuse me, why did you save that subject line? Is there a certain word that caught your attention, maybe a power word, or is it maybe the structure of the subject line that caught your attention? You could then take that and rewrite the subject line and combine it with Jana's idea to brainstorm all those different ideas and end up picking the best one. If you have a team or a few people that you can include at your company, maybe show them, show them all of your ideas that you've brainstormed and have them help you to pick on the best one or vote for which one catches their attention. So a few ideas, let's say we really love this one, which by the way, I really do love the structure of this example. You plus us equals more clients for you. It's just a simple way to write a subject line. So if we look over here on the right, we've got some examples. The first one is from a pizzeria. You plus pizza equals dinner tonight. Really simple, but it tells me the value of what's in that email and, and why I might actually wanna go buy a pizza tonight. We've got ABC dealer financing down below. The example there is your customers plus our financing equals happy. And I really loved the pre-header text with this one. Great rates and service without the BS. Something we all would love to strive for, right? And then we've got an animal shelter down below. You plus Buddy, Buddy's the name of the dog, equals happily ever after. And so I really loved how these all turned out um, and just a couple of ways that you can take something and modify it. Let's talk about a few other ideas. So we've got alliteration, which is repeating the same first letter for each word. An example here would be six seasonal saving secrets. 
And you can take that in a million different directions for whatever you're selling or promoting or what your content is about. Then we've got chunking, which is actually an idea of that plus and equal sign that we were just looking about in the previous example. You can also use chunking just by simply writing short phrases or words together. So in this one, it says new leggings, soft and comfy. And then we've got allusion. Allusion is where you're referring to pop culture or some sort of famous line. In this example, it says, we know what you did yesterday referring to a Halloween store in a sale. And something I want to mention there is I've recently seen one, actually last week it was, because it, last week was Valentine's Day, I believe. And so uh, rhymes or even a short poem, if you have a way to include that in a subject line, I think is great. One of my favorite animal shelters here in Colorado did a play on a poem for their Valentine's Day email. And the subject line said, roses are red, violets are blue, Animals need your support this Valentine's Day too. I loved it. So another idea is to actually tell a joke. In today's world, I think we all need a few laughs here and there. So try to be that source of happiness and laughing in their day. Here's one from an animal shelter that says, which dog breed is Dracula's favorite? Which if you're not sure of the answer there, the answer is a bloodhound. That's Dracula's favorite dog. <laughs> So, uh, Jaina, what's your perspective on using some of these creative ideas um, and maybe anything that stands out to you or you've seen in your inbox? Yeah, so funnily enough, we actually used alliteration in our newsletter that we sent out on Tuesday. Subject line wasn't going to, I'm going to completely muddle this up, but it was practically perfect personalized email. So it's like leaning into repeating the same letter P there. And it was a bit of a pop culture reference because um, we, it's a throwback to Mary Poppins, the original Mary Poppins. So it was kind of balancing the two out, but you didn't necessarily have to know that it was about Mary Poppins. So we kind of combined those two things there. Um, it's always fun to do things like that because I think what well, we didn't actually land on that subject line initially when we were writing out all of our subject lines we had that brain dump of subject lines and then as we were looking through all of them like hey we could do some fun alliteration with that because we combined a few subject lines to get this really nice bit of alliteration so it's it's a nice way to inject some fun and put your subscribers in like that happy mood before you even before they've even opened the email so they're already going into it with that kind of positive feeling um Pop culture is another one that we have tried in the past. It can be a little bit hit and miss because you you need to be really aware of your audience and who they are, what their kind of maybe it's their age range or maybe what's their kind of role they're in on a day to day basis. Because um, you don't want to alienate your audience. I think one example that always pops out to me is May the 4th. So May the 4th is a Star Wars reference. And on that day when people send emails, there's a lot of leaning to May the 4th be with you. But Yes, Star Wars is huge and I, I'm a massive Star Wars fan myself, but I wouldn't necessarily rely on your entire audience knowing what that pop cultural reference is. So understand your audience and you could definitely leverage um, some of those pop cultural references, which can be super powerful as well. Definitely. I love that idea that you were able to share and it was perfect timing because you just sent that email out. So Tori <laughs> asks, do you think telling a joke could lean into being unpro unprofessional? Um, oops, my question window scrolled there. Would the joke have to be directly related to my company? Um, I'm going to start out, Gina, but I would say no. So, well, it depends on, you know, if you can tie it into whatever you're writing about in your email. In this particular email for a dog shelter, it was tying into a Halloween email, which dog breed is Dracula's favorite. And then they were going to be featuring the bloodhound in, in the newsletter and featuring the dog's name and trying to get this dog adopted. So if you can be creative enough and, you know, brainstorm again to see um, if it's something. And again, I would say this goes back to knowing your audience, like Jane has said maybe once or twice already is you know make sure it's in good taste with the people who are in your audience. Jaina anything else you might want to add to that one? Yeah I completely agree I think knowing your audience um, having a joke that's relevant to the content of the email so it doesn't again you want to avoid just telling a joke in your subject line for the sake of it to get that open um, so making making sure it's relevant um, and if you can't think of a joke, you don't necessarily have to have, it doesn't have necessarily have to be a joke, but I come from more so the B2B side of things. And there's sometimes no reliance of thinking that 
you can't be funny, you can't be in music and subject lines, you've got to be very serious. But that's, I would say that's far from the truth. If you can inject some some humor and some you know, some humanity into your subject lines by telling a joke, I would say go for it. But again, test it out, know your audience um, and all that jazz. Yeah, in the end, you're still uh, sending an email to people regardless of the company that they work for. So I think if you're going to make any progress in selling them something or getting them to take advantage of a piece of content you have, you've got to have that connection and, you know, make it have a have a relationship with them a little bit and get them to connect with you. And I think in a lot of ways, being funny, having a little bit of a joke is, is a great way to go about that. Again, testing it out, like Jaina has said. So we've got more examples for these creative ideas and more in the handout. So if you haven't already, go to the right-hand side of your screen. There's the dark blue bar down the side, and there's the little paper or document looking icon. Click on that, and then you can download that. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about some data-driven subject lines that really tend to work for most people. Let's talk about my favorite, which is actually probably personalization. Personalizing a subject line can increase open rates by 50%. And you can really personalize with a name, which I think is great in a lot of cases, but you can personalize by more than that. Really, email marketing and being effective with your email marketing is all about relevancy. Someone knowing based on this subject line that this email is relevant to me and it's not going to be wasting my time is really going to be beneficial. So what that means is you could really personalize your subject line with a contact detail. Maybe that contact detail pulls in dynamically so that the subject line could look a little bit different for each contact on your list. Maybe it's also a product or a service that they've purchased in the past, or maybe they've clicked on and they've shown interest in it. Or it could also mean that you've taken your bigger list. You've probably, if you've joined us before, you've heard us talk about this idea of sending relevant information and segmenting your list into smaller groups. So in that case, maybe we're sending this email just to an entire group of people, of people who we know are interested in our small business hiring guide. Again, it's all about what's relevant to them. So, Jana, I know you've done some testing with your own audience here, and I'd love to hear the tips and advice you have for our audience. Yeah, it's personalization of subject line. Such a, it's a fun thing to do. Um, I would suggest uh, make sure you have a fallback or you have something there so that if you don't have the person's phone, first first name. There's going to be a, the subject line doesn't read disjointed. So, for example, that first one, we've got savings for you, Elizabeth. Make sure that you, when, if you don't have this person's first name um, and it's not a blank space there, the punctuation still works. So, that's kind of the really core tips that I would suggest there. And if you are using first name personalization in the subject line, um, beware of that magpie effect. Some, something that we saw in some of our emails when we started introducing the first name into the subject line was that people started opening them at a very much, much higher rate. And I was like, this is great. I'm, I'm really excited about this. It's doing what we want it to do. But what happened, those, those, when, we, when we used that subject line, our click to open rate started decreasing. So what we were getting was that people were seeing their first name in the subject line and being drawn to open an email, but they had no real intention of clicking through on the email and taking action on it. So it's one of those things that We've stopped doing a little bit because we know for our audience, it doesn't really give us the end goal that we want it to. Um, so that's definitely something to to look out for. But we we lean into segmentation a lot for personalizing our subject lines. So we'll have lots of different groups and we'll cater the subject lines to those different groups if we aren't necessarily personalizing by dynamic content in the subject line itself. I love that. And there was a couple of questions about um, the open rates and things like that. And especially with the Apple privacy features that have come out, you know, in general, we're saying don't focus so much on your open rate. So in that case, like what you were saying, Jaina, is to look at your, your click rates and things like that is are people actually taking action? And that could actually be a better way to look at that information because one, you get want to get them to open that email, but in most cases, you're going to want them to take an action after. So let, the big question is, are they taking that action we want them to take? All right, so this next one is the word free. Using the word free in the subject line increases open rates by 
Now in the past, we've actually seen things like free and using exclamation points and even all caps in the subject line, causing it to land in a spam or junk folder. Well, it appears that times have changed. And what I want you to keep in mind, there's been a few questions about subject lines leading to uh, spam filtration and, and going into the junk folder. What I wanna suggest you do there is to go into your spam and junk folder every once in a while and to see what are some things that are constantly getting stuck in that spam filter. But in terms of free and some of these other things, it's really changed and we can see that they're actually making it to the inbox. Jana, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about this. What are some of the things you're seeing in your inbox and landing in the spam filter and even what you're experiencing from Litmus and the emails you sent? Yeah, I looked at my own inbox earlier this morning and there are so many emails from retailers all using the word free, using um, subject, using exclamation points, using more than one exclamation point, and they're all making it to my inbox. And the reason there is that inbox providers are really relying more on how people are engaging and interacting with your emails as a sender versus the content that might be in the subject line or the content that's actually in the body of the email they're relying on how people are engaging with it so if you are sending email that isn't potentially engaging your audience you may end up in the spam filter which is another reason why you should be really working hard to optimize your your subject lines to make sure you get people to open and engage with your emails but we have used free in our subject lines we often have a lot of um, thought leadership pieces, so like ebooks, reports, we doubt we offer them for free, we'll use the word free in the subject line. It's never landed us in, um, in a spot of bother with uh, any inbox provider. I don't think we've ever had an issue. We've used exclamation points as well. No problems there. I will suggest though, only use it when you really mean it. So if you're going to use the word free, don't use it when it's sort of not free. Use it when you're actually meaning, yep, this is free. And then don't use it on every single subject line because your audience is going to get so tired of that and they're going to get numb to the word free. It's not going to mean anything to them. Yes, I can't agree more. The other thing I want to point out is along with free, uh, as we can see in these examples, um, using free in all caps is actually working fine these days. So definitely take that information, um, using all caps, maybe try it. I wouldn't write out an entire subject line in all caps, by the way. Uh, it can make it hard to read and look like you're yelling at your audience, which I hope you're not wanting to do. Um, but we see here a couple of examples on the screen. One day till Christmas, get a free store credit with any gift was the full uh, subject line at the top, and then snag our free guide on effective email design. So definitely a few things to try there. Now, when appropriate, I think it's also a good idea to include a sense of urgency in your subject line. So here we're seeing that including a sense of urgency can have can increase your open rates by 22%. Now, this also helps to create a fear of missing out or FOMO, which uh, Jane, I believe you mentioned earlier, which I think is huge in today's world. We've got technology that gives us things instantaneously. So saying that in the subject line really tends to perform well. So I think you can use words like limited time only, only X days left, or in an example for a webinar we did a while back is we're going live in four hours. We often tend to use last chance and tomorrow. Those tend to work really well for us. Um, and I also love like the final hours or it's the final day. So what a advice or maybe some other ideas to include a sense of urgency in the subject line? Yeah, we have, uh, we've leaned into the word tomorrow pretty hard on our own webinar emails. So when we are sending an email out the day before a webinar, we will use the word tomorrow in the subject line or pre-header text because um, that's, again, that sense of urgency, like this is happening tomorrow because your email is fighting for attention in the inbox. And if you can add that sense of urgency with either one of these words here, it can really help um, help your email stand out and then eventually people will find it and take action on it. And we've used words like, last chance as well we're promoting our litmus live events um, to get people to purchase tickets because that's a it's another great uh, tactic for creating that urgency i will say though make sure again like the word free you actually mean it so if you're going to put that sense of urgency in there it has to feel urgent it can't be something that's happening in maybe a few months time so if you say last chance and then the end date for the offer is six months time that's not a last chance so make sure that the, the offer and the urgency match there. 
I can't agree more. Don't tell me something is urgent. And then I open it up and I'm like, well, I just wasted two minutes reading that because I thought this email was urgent and it's not. So definitely goes back to that whole idea of be, being misleading or deceptive. Only use it when it's appropriate. This next one is all about using numbers. Subject lines that include numbers get a 45% higher open rate. So Jaina, what are your experiences and thoughts on using numbers in a subject line? Everyone loves a listicle these days. I feel like the, there are, I mean, I feel like Buzzfeed has made us really love lists now. And I feel like numbers are that great way of introducing that, that love of listicles into your subject line. It's something that's so familiar to folks now that they'll see a number in there and it's um it's an instant, it's it, it's an instant recognition of what to expect from the email as well. So make sure that you if you say three accessories to make you feel fabulous, you've then got three accessories in your email to make people feel fabulous. And then I would suggest limit the number so don't go any higher than i would say 10 i feel like any number higher than 10 people tend to don't really understand what that is i think uh, three is a great number we've used three and maybe even five uh, lots of times when we've uh, included numbers in our subject lines absolutely so yeah what i've seen in the statistics is don't use any more than the number nine i think it's when it starts getting into the double digits that it can make an email or a list of tips or ideas or products seem a little bit overwhelming start that subject line off with a number like in the examples we see here the listicles which is basically what we're seeing in these subject lines something that people love you tell me five cleaning tips to make my life a lot easier i'm i'm bound to open up that email and find out all right so this is another one that i love which is asking a question in your subject line Subject lines with questions get 10% more opens. And I really love this one because you can pique someone's interest and really depending on how you're asking the question, it could get them to say, yes, I wanna solve that problem or yes, I wanna buy that product. So what advice do you have here when it comes to asking a question in the subject? Uh, one thing, I, I love asking questions in subject lines. I think it's one of those things that can prompt people to uh, think of your email and think of the content of their email before they've even opened it. So that's what I, I really love to do. And make sure you answer that question. So if you have a sub, if you have a question in the subject line, either it gets the answer gets teased in the pre-header text, and then eventually when you open the email, the full question gets answered. So don't leave people hanging if you use a question in your subject line. Make sure it gets answered eventually in the email because that's going to help them uh, make the decision whether they want to click through or not. Yeah, and make that answer obvious. So earlier we had the question with the joke of what is Dracula's favorite dog? Put that somewhere in, in the email, maybe towards the top. Maybe it could be a headline, but you want people to make an almost instant connection because when you ask me a question like that, I'm someone who really wants to know the answer. So make sure it's pretty prominent somewhere in your in your email, even if it's one of the first things at the top. So let's talk about this last one, which is actually all about using emojis. Someone just asked a question a few minutes ago and I lost it already. Uh, this always seems to be a source of controversy, Jana, Jana, and I think in a lot of cases, it can really help you to save space by illustrating a concept or an emotion. Companies that use emojis in subject lines have a 56% higher open rate compared to businesses that don't. So what is your thoughts on using emojis and the advice you have? I love using emoji. I feel like they have a, they definitely have a place in the subject line. I would suggest um, when you're using emoji, when you write the subject line, take the emoji out and see if the subject line still makes sense. Because if you need the emoji in there for the subject line to make sense, and for someone to understand what the email is about, I think that's not the right way of using emoji. Use emoji as a support to the text that's in the subject line. Um, and also you wanna keep, you wanna make sure that like a lot of the things that we've talked about, you test this out on your own audience because some, um, some emoji will work better. Sometimes it, sometimes some emoji won't work as well. And then also, um, one issue that's not very talked about when it comes to emoji is accessibility. So I just mentioned the need for you to read your subject line without the emoji and see if it still makes sense. Because there are a lot of folks out there who use screen readers to um, to read their emails. So imagine if you had um, one of these subject lines and the emoji was an integral part to understand what the subject line is. Screen reader isn't gonna read out the emoji. So make sure that 
you are considering accessibility when it comes to your subject lines as well as the content of your email. That's a great point. And the information about uh, each each emoji you choose can render differently on different devices and different email programs. So testing it out, these emojis that we're seeing here actually look different in all the different email programs and within the slide deck that we put together today. And sometimes they're not even going to show up, like Jana said. And what it looks like in that case is just going to be a little blank box where the subject line should be. So I am fully on board with testing that subject line. If it shows up as a box or whatever seems to happen with an individual email program, is it going to be okay and is it going to make sense? So emojis, I really think, Jana, can be used in a lot of different in industries. I always get a little pushback, especially from people in the B2B world or the business to business world, they're more hesitant. So you're sending emails for Litmus, which is B2B for the most part. What is your experience in, in using emojis for the B2B audience? Our B2B audience love it. I mean, we've never had any pushback on using emoji. We use, we maybe don't go and use the wildest emoji out there because we you know we are a B2B audience. So we're going to stick to using those uh, emoji that are more prevalent and more commonly used. So I think the camera is a good one here or like a just simple smiley face. And there are some very, very common ones. So I think the, the thing to remember is even if you are a B2B marketer, you're still marketing to human beings. We've just, we talked about, I think that earlier on as well, you're, you're marketing to other people. And right now, emoji are such a um, ingrained piece of language almost in our technology. I mean, I, I could have a full on conversation with my husband in an emoji. I feel like that's, that's the level that we're at because we're using emoji in text messaging, in um, all sorts of apps like WhatsApp, Signal, all sorts of things. We're all using emoji there. So it just makes sense for us to bring some of that language into the subject lines as well. And again, you don't have to go mad with the type of uh, emoji that you use. I think there was one email that I got um, a little while ago and I can't remember which, which sender it was, but they used an emoji and it was, nicely well placed but I had no idea what the emoji was I was squinting at it I was staring at my screen I didn't understand it so that's another thing to be careful of if you're going to use emoji use something that is quite commonly used versus something that's a little bit more obscure and is going to take people a moment to realize what it is but for the b2b audience I would say test it out try it out it's um and see what results you get definitely and I would say don't use all the time um depending on your audience I think you shared some some examples with me, Jaina, and some companies are using them a little bit more, which I think is great, but I think you also need to make sure you're including a variety and in different types of subject lines, not just different types of emojis in a subject line. And someone was asking where to find emojis. If you're in constant contact and you go to create your subject line, you'll see it just to the right. I believe it looks like a little smiley face icon and you click on that and it'll open up the existing emojis. There's also what's called Emojipedia. I'm gonna share a link with you all in the chat window. And that's where you can go and you can find more. Usually what you do is you just copy and paste it into the subject line. Remember those things though, they're not gonna show up for every single person out there. They can render a little bit different, look different, which could change the meaning of your subject line. So definitely test them out. I love Emojipedia, I use that, I reference that one a lot because it also shows you what your emoji will look like in the different, uh, different browsers or different email clients as well. So you'll be able to see the differences when you go on that website and you'll even be able to see which ones don't work on certain devices too. Oh, that's awesome. I haven't played around with Emojipedia enough lately to realize that it does that, but that is very cool. Good to know. All right, so the whole theme with every idea we've talked about today is to test. Every single one of you in the audience today here, you have a different audience of your own. Your subscriber base is different. And this is where testing really comes into play so that you can see what works for your audience and what they're going to best respond to. This is what's called A-B testing, or sometimes you'll hear marketers call it split testing. It all means the same thing. But A-B testing is an experiment that involves creating two versions of your marketing material. Usually you'll have an option A and an option B, and then you release them both to see which one performs better. Now, A-B testing can be used to test a variety of marketing ideas and email marketing elements like your design, uh, your call to action, but especially your subject line. So you've done a lot of testing in uh, in Litmus. So what advice do you have for the audience when it comes to A-B testing? 
Um, do it as much and as often as you can. Uh, make sure you're collecting all of your results um, and test over time. Um, what often happens is we as marketers will do a ton of testing and we'll learn some really cool things and we'll put them into action, but then we won't go back and test the same thing again because we think we've already found the results. But there's so many different things that can impact why someone does or does not open your um, open your email that isn't necessarily just a subject line. It could be just something to do with seasonality. So the inbox might be really, really crowded. So that might play into why they may or may not have opened the email. Your audience might have changed. So as you build your list or as you build your audience, your audience is growing and your the, the makeup of your audience is growing. So ch change, um, check your A-B testing and, and do it once every quarter or once every month if you send email very often. But uh, test over time and test frequently is what I would suggest. I would say that's even more important in the last couple of years, Jaina, with everything that's happened, that the world in itself is changing every single day. So I think some of our habits are changing. So I love that whole idea of testing seasonally or at least on a regular basis. So you're starting to see the makeup and what people in your audience are responding to, because we can give you the data that people have performed the tests on and it can be general to you, but maybe emojis will work great for you. And then we've got someone over here and people did not respond well in that audience. So you can have completely different results. All right, so you've actually been really generous and shared a few of the A-B tests that you've run with your own emails at Litmus. We've got two tests and Jana, I'll have you walk us through the first one. Yes, so every every year we, uh, we announce a report, it's called the State of ESPs, um, and the report kind of is, is one of our big pillar pieces. For this email, we wanted to figure out whether the branding, the state of branding that we have is strong enough to get someone to open the email and then eventually download the content piece. Or if we introduce a bit of intrigue and a kind of like almost that question sort of statement into the subject line with subject line A, so everyone's favorite ESP is dot, dot, dot. And we're kind of trying to lead folks into the email with that, uh, with that sense of intrigue or whether just having a very simple, straightforward new report, the state of ESP is gonna work. What we actually learned was subject line A was the winner here because um, it was that sense of intrigue. It wasn't, um, and it was, I think we had a lift of about 22% open to download rate. So we had 22% of people opening and downloading the content piece with that subject line versus the other one. So again, we're looking beyond the open rate here. We're looking at people who are actually taking action based on that subject line. So yeah, it was a great one to tease out and it's something that, I think we'll probably end up testing again because the new year and new people on our list and um, new situation with the world. <laughs> awesome. Yes, I totally agree. So tell us about test two. Yeah, test two is a bit more creative, a bit more interesting. So this is for our newsletter. It's our monthly newsletter. We sent a um, Halloween theme newsletter around October. Um, and for this one, we have an emoji in both the uh, both of the different subject lines we have here. But we wanted to understand whether simply having a question that kind of is a bit fun is enough to get someone to open versus something that we know uh, will get someone to open. So we already know HTML versus plain text is a massive debate among email marketers. We've got tons of different content pieces around it and we know it always gets a ton of traction. So we wanted to know, is that gonna get someone to open or is simply having something funny in the subject line gonna, open, gonna get people to open? And actually it was, version B that got the highest click to open rate on that one. So we got, I think it was a 10% lift in click to open rate on the on the second subject line there because we teased out something that we already knew that our audience were really, really, um, really, really into. So, and we also, we featured that content as well in the, in the newsletter. So that helped that journey going from open to content to click. Awesome. So I have a question Question from Christine. Once you know which test performs better, do you resend it to the other people who received the other test? So we don't do that sort of testing at Limits. We're Because the goal for A-B testing for us is simply to learn. So we will split our entire audience in two randomly, and we will send both of those two sets of audiences, the two different subject lines, and we will learn that way. We mostly do that because our email calendar is so busy. Um, we have so many different emails going out for us to control our uh, volume of email. It's way easier for us to just send that one email on one day and do a 50-50 split send and just focus on the learnings there. But you can absolutely send 
do a portion of a test the subject lines on a portion of your audience and then send the winner to the rest of your audience but definitely think about your email calendar when you're when you're doing things like that because you don't necessarily want to send to the winners and you've already got another email going out the next day and someone's getting a lot of your emails in their inbox yeah, I would say I completely agree with what you just said. Um, if you are going to do that where you want to resend to the people who received the other one but maybe didn't take action, be careful with it because you don't want them to feel like they're receiving the exact same email with maybe a different subject line that can turn them off. They'll be like, I already received this, delete, unsubscribe, or sometimes they could even just say spam or junk, which we don't want them to do. So I would suggest being really careful with that. Maybe only sending to the people who did not open could be a good way to go about that if you feel that you really need to send that email with that best subject line to them. All right, so we're in a good place. Let's go ahead and start to wrap up. There are tons and tons of questions that we're gonna uh, get to here in a minute. So let's recap a few things. Make sure that your subject line and your pre-header text are working together. That pre-header text should really be used as an extension of your subject line in order to provide more context or value as to why they should open this email. Make sure you're using a variety of subject lines. We've shared a lot of different ideas that you can try to stand out and catch your subscribers' attention. And remember, there's data that supports the use of several things like personalization and emojis in your subject line. Don't forget, you wanna make sure you've got variety in there, but A-B testing is gonna be really valuable to you. And make sure that you're testing over time so that you can start to look for those trends and even changes in your audience as to what's going to best stand out to your audience now in this state of the world. So don't forget we've got a copy of the slides in the handout that includes even more examples that we didn't see today. So you can download that from the GoToWebinar dashboard. It's the document looking icon. Now, I wanted to mention just for a minute that Constant Contact has so many great tools to help your small business or organization. There's websites, stores, email, and social media, and more to help you along the way. So if you don't already have an account, you can sign up for a free trial. Just go to constantcontact.com or we'll have Rachel, who's helping behind the scenes, share a link in the chat window there. I also want to let you know about our webinar coming up next month. It's Get New and Repeat Business on Autopilot with Email Marketing. So if you want to learn more about email automation and how it can work for you, um, we'll be sharing a link to that in the chat window as well. All right, so let's get to all of these great questions. Actually, one more thing. When we end the webinar today, a survey is going to pop up on your screen, and I'd really love it if you take just two minutes and let us know what you thought about the webinar today. All right, so we've got a question from Diana here. Uh, she says, in your from line, do you recommend putting your name and company name? What's your suggestion there? Yes, definitely put name and company name. Um, just because uh, I often get a lot of emails that are from specific companies, but it has the person's name in there, but I don't know who that person is. So um, putting your company in the, name in there will help people recollect and remember and know who that brand name is actually the email is actually from. Definitely. And I would I would say I've seen some guidance can vary based on different industries. If you're uh, sending to consumers versus B2B, sending to businesses, or maybe if you're in the nonprofit world, sometimes those things can vary. So again, back with the theme of testing is you might test out what is the best from name to use with your own audience. It goes back to that idea of rec uh, recognizing one and also trusting who the email is coming from. And I think in a lot of ways, having a person's name and then the company name can be really great. Adds that personality to it. So this next one comes from Courtney. My biggest issue is the emails I send keep going to people's spam, even if they have added me as a safe sender. Any tips or tricks for Courtney? Yes, so this is a, a while ago, but we had um, we had an issue with Gmail specifically, and uh, I think for a course of about a week or so, all of our emails kept going to the Gmail spam folder. So what we did was we segmented out um, our Gmail audience. We identified in that Gmail audience the folks who are actually engaging and opening our emails, um, and then we sent to that audience. So anyone who was with Gmail and wasn't engaging with our emails, we separated them out, we segmented them out, we didn't send them emails for about six weeks. And we focused on 
building up our reputation again with that more engaged group, with that specific who we know open in Gmail. And it did take us a while, so it did take us about six weeks, but eventually we got to a point where our reputation had built back up again, and we were able to get all of our emails delivered to Gmail's inbox. But it does take time. It can feel like you have failed as an email marketer. You have not failed as an email marketer. This happens to every one of us. Um, but it's just a matter of kind of really identifying who isn't receiving it, is there a pattern there? Can you segment them out? And then focus on your more engaged group. And even if you don't have um, if you don't have the data to know which email clients your audience is opening the emails in, start just shift and look at the people who are engaging with your emails. Focus on sending emails to those folks, those ones who are clicking through on every single one of them, um, and start building up your engagement and reputation again with that group. Awesome. And Courtney, I want to mention we've got a whole team. Um, there are deliverability team at Constant Contact. Rachel and Jill are actually helping behind the scenes. Maybe one of you can uh, find the information to contact that team because I know people often uh, will every once in a while have an issue with their emails landing in spam. They can have a conversation with you one on one as and take a look at your emails and do some testing as to figure out why or what is causing that to happen. Is it just one email? Is it all of the emails that you're sending out? And that way they can give you a good one-to-one -one perspective as well. But uh, Gina had some great information and suggestions there as well. So Jess, Jessica asks, words versus character limits, limits for the subject and pre-header. Do you have any advice? I think I've only seen the stats within the, the words that we shared, the word limits. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen anything specific around character limit. Um, again, it's something, one of those things that you test around, play with, um, see what drives with your audience, um, and, um, yeah, see which email clients your audience are using. And if there's a, if they're only using mobile devices, then maybe you focus a little bit more on character limits rather than word limits. Good point. All right. So... Veronica says, I see the latest trend is putting the type of content in the brackets before the subject to indicate what the email is about. Is this recommended? I'll, I'll tackle this one first if that's okay and then I'll hand it to you. But I actually love this idea. It makes what's in those brackets really stand out to me. I would suggest not using it again every single time. But I've seen it worked really well for webinars. You can say like free webinar or webinar in a bracket. Um, you could say guide or something like that. Uh, Jaina, anything from your perspective on using brackets? Yes. So um, we lean into that. We, we used to use them quite often for webinars, exactly the same reason. We would put free webinar or webinar in the square brackets at the front of the subject line. What we recently learned is on Gmail and mobile devices, the text that's in the square brackets will get truncated after a certain number of characters and I think it's five characters where it gets truncated so yes use it but if you have a high percentage of your audience who are opening your emails on a gmail on a mobile device I would suggest avoid using it because you will it, it truncates just what's in the square brackets it's very bizarre I feel like email clients all do weird things just what's in the square brackets it'll truncate it but if you keep it under a certain number of characters it's just fine uh, good thing to test out. Do the actual send to your to one or a few email inboxes. Great idea. So John says, what are idea call to action words that work? Save the date gets okay results, but they want to improve their opening. What advice do you have? And then I'm guessing this is specific to the kind of events or um, that kind of thing. I think um, so. That's a great question. I'm. I'm struggling to think of something here actually thinking maybe something like add to your calendar or something that is similar but maybe um maybe save the date has been just overused by so many different industries because i know I, I get everything from retail emails to even b2b folks with uh, webinars saying hey save the date so maybe just kind of add to your calendar or save the, um i wouldn't use the word save I'm trying to think of a different word for the other term save but um yeah, struggling on this one, actually, Stephanie. I mean, initially I was thinking like register, but that would be like if you have a wait list or something like that, that you could have them do that. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting one to think about because save the day, I would feel like it's not going to catch my attention. Um, yeah, maybe putting the actual date of the event 
uh, in the subject line as well. That could potentially be using numbers, using some sort of different variety in there. That could potentially um, get folks to open versus save the date. Maybe that's something to test. Maybe you can also test this with the bracket idea. So depending on what your event mm -hmm. is, is it um, a gala of something? Is it a fundraising event? Is it a webinar? Is it an educational event? Maybe put that in brackets, maybe include the date or something like that and test a few of these different ideas to see what's gonna to, to work for you. Mark your calendar is what Renee said. Uh, Janet has a suggestion, have you saved the day? Hold the date. So all of your peers are, are sending some great suggestions for you. So I love it. So Anita asks, what if you want to promote a sale but not sound like every other sale email out there? Um, is there something specific in the sale? Is it for a specific time period? Um, maybe calling out pieces that are in the sale. So being getting very, very specific with it. Um, that's a hard one though, because obviously I feel like everyone's running a sale almost every single day on a variety of different things. But I would say if you can get really specific about it and even maybe personalize. So if you if you know that maybe um, the person who is you're sending the email to, maybe they buy specifically menswear or women's wear, or maybe there's a certain type of jewelry that they always buy, maybe you bring some of that into the subject line. So instead of just saying general something is on sale, but you call out a specific item in the subject line to say, hey, this thing that you've been looking at is now on sale. Um, that might be a great tactic to try. Awesome, I love that. And I've seen some of our customers, like I'm not sure how often they're running sales so that could play into it, but just strictly saying, you know, is your sale 10% off or something like that? And then again, what is the specificity of it? Is it 10% off on clothing today? Maybe add that sense of urgency in there um, and, and let people know the details there. All right, so I see we're running out of time. Let's try to answer one more question here. Uh, this one comes from Craig. Do you have recommendations of words to avoid that trigger spam filters? Are there any commonalities or things that you're tending to see not work? I'm not actually seeing things uh, specific words that sh you should avoid for your spam uh, in case of um, getting delivered to the spam filters. Um, yeah, that's, I, I'm trying to think of my own spam spam folder. I, I can't think of anything that's really jumps out at me. I mean, people are using all sorts of different words, all sorts of different phrases. Um, just try to test it out and see what happens in your own and send an email. If you're unsure about it, maybe, um, do a smaller send with that subject line that you're unsure about rather than sending to your entire audience. If you, if you're, if you think, Hey, this, this might lead us to the spam folder, um, test out a small audience, see what happens with that smaller audience. And if it's fine, then go ahead and send it to the rest of the group, I would say. Okay. Great idea. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Just check what's in your spam filter. Um, I know we didn't get to all of the questions today. So what I'll do is for everyone that didn't get an answer to their question, I'm going to do uh, some answering them. What I'll do is I'll have them posted on our community. I will include the link to that within the follow up email. So look for that follow up email that has a link to that. And I'll also do a little bit of digging and see if I can find a little bit more research. Uh, Gina, I think I heard you say earlier that maybe email inboxes aren't looking so much at the subject line in terms of what's getting filtered. Is is that pretty accurate too? I think so, yes. It's kind of they're looking at how people are engaging with emails and how people are engaging with different senders that often dictates what gets put into the spam or junk folder versus what gets delivered. Gotcha. So maybe it's not so much what's in your subject line. It could be some things within the body of your email, but I'll see if I can find some stats or anything um, while I'm answering all these other questions. So I want to thank you all so much for joining us today and participating, sharing your questions and your guidance to the, the other questions in there. Jaina, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. This has been great. Um, and I really hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Stephanie. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.